that means that if if you've got the heel of the neck sort of sitting in your armpit the way that Gary plays without changing your arm position changing your body position within the swing of your arms is the entire compass of the bass you can reach back and and hit the lowest notes and you can reach forward and hit the highest notes without having to move your body at all and you can't do that with other basses Today's guest is a legend in the bass luthier world. We are chatting today with James Ham. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Bass Conversations, and Jim Ham is a name I've known ever since I think I started college. I heard about this bass that Jim had made for Gary Carr, and we talk about that for sure, and I believe it was 1995, and it's just a revolutionary design, and Jim has been involved in so many evolutionary and revolutionary really designs in the bass world he's got this amazing if you're not familiar with it this amazing adjustable neck system his basses produce just fantastic sound big bold beautiful sound Gary Carr swears by them that's what he's playing on these days they're all over the globe and I just so appreciate Jim taking the time to chat with me I'd like to thank our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, and the A440 Violin Shop. More on them later, but let's dive into this conversation with Jim Ham. Well, are you are you at, working on in the shop at this point? Are you working yeah, on basses? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, quite honestly, I'm not doing much work on basses these days, but uh, lots of violins and bows. Really? Okay. Yep. Okay. Wow. I mean, I've I've got um, some bases here that um, uh, oh, a couple of jobs that I just got done, and and I've got a bunch of bases that um, I need to be getting on with fixing up. But I've got actually a whole lot of instruments that um, I've accumulated over the years that, with the idea of um, always having something to sort of fix up and sell in case. I run out of repair work, but I haven't run out of repair work for more than 40 years, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that, that's an in, instinctual thing, sort of. Got the, got the work ready to go, just in case. Things. Yeah, and it's yeah. kind of, uh, uh, I'm at a life stage where I really need to get those things out the door now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and, and, and not get any more. <laughs> Oh man, wow. You know, I was I was just down in Las Vegas uh uh-huh. maybe 2 months ago at at Gary Carr's place. Yeah, so you sent I, me that picture. Yeah, yeah, isn't that and and so it's it, it was so cool to see. I mean, I've seen your bases before certainly, uh-huh. but it was great to be up close and personal and see that that in action yeah. and uh, so yeah, so so that and I I know you've gone in the past to the Oberlin workshop. Are you planning on going this year, or do you, do you go to that anymore? Or um, I'm just curious. Yeah, um, I've been going regularly. Uh, I go at, uh, to the violin acoustics workshop, and uh, um, how long? Fifteen years or more every year. And this summer, I'm not going to go. Oh, okay. And, and the reason that I'm not going to do that is I've been sort of doing things that I've always wanted to do and never got uh, got around to. And always in the third week of June, um, when uh, the violin stuff is going on in Oberlin, um, or very close to that time, is the National Old Time Fiddle Championship in Weezer, Idaho, which it's not only a fiddle contest, although it is that. Um, there's really a lot of uh, jam sessions and, and um, uh, all kinds of um, bluegrass and swing and fiddle stuff that I've, I've always wanted to go and I've never been and I'm going to go this summer. 
Nice, nice. Well, that'll be a fun summer. I, I this is the first. I actually am going to go. A uh, few a few luthiers invited me to go and and uh, do some interviews and that sort of stuff with with people there. So I'm I'm gonna head. Up. We've got an international society basis board meeting. We're gonna tour Bloomington, and then right after that is or right that same weekend. I think is the VSA workshop for oh, base workshop. Uh- so you're going to go to Oberlin? I'm going to go. Yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I just decided um, this year I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It, which is the first time for a long, long time. Uh, uh, I think I only missed it once before, and that had to do with a sort of a family health emergency. Okay. Nothing to. Yeah. Wow. But, wow. Uh, well, maybe maybe our paths will cross again there some 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 other year. It's every two years, right? Isn't that how that works? Oh, okay. The the uh, base workshop, which I started. You. Um, that's what I thought. Yeah. Cool. No, I it, it I started it, and I um, uh, uh, you know, since I've been going to Oberlin for a long time, and and I uh, always thought that there needed to be some some bass content there and there never was i mean uh, there's the violin makers and the bow makers and um uh, all of that's great and um the the basic idea <clears throat> the first violin makers workshop which was uh, um primarily about violin restoration was started by nigo um vaca Nigigosian, and i don't know how long ago that was probably 30 years now um i I'd have to look it up but um you know the basic idea that nigo had was that um um information knowledge about about violins instead should not be secret which you know the violin world was always sort of a secret society with uh, um the um sort of in crowd uh, keeping things to themselves and Nigo um, decided that um, it should instead be shared and that <clears throat> everybody benefits from uh, from sharing information in fact the motto was everyone teaches everyone learns <clears throat> nice, nice. Um, so anyway I, I, since I, I guess I opened my mouth more than once saying, well, there ought to be a bit, some base content. Uh, a couple of people said, well, why don't you make that happen? And then I, so I, I did and I t- talked to, you know, people in the VSA about doing that. And it was my idea to, you know, ask Jay Van de Koppel to, um, help out with organizing because he's a much more organized person than I am <laughs> and I brought David Gage on board for that and and so that was the first one it was uh, I was the director with Jay and on um, David as the uh, people and then uh, after that uh, which was a really intense experience um, I decided that I uh, I should then pass that on to let other people do that. Was that in the '90s that that started? When when did that start? Uh, the 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 base component of the the workshop. Um, I think 2010. Oh oh, it's that recent. Okay okay, wow, cool. Yeah, uh, but the Oberlin workshops have been going on for a long time. And yeah, the the reason for it being every two years is to not compete with ISB. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it's, not, the, it's, it's not the off with, year. Okay. That's, yeah, so they alternate. How, how the heck did you end up in Victoria then? What was that path from... from uh, because... My father, um, actually, both of my parents went to the School of Mines in Rapid City. Okay. Um, which is where my dad graduated in electrical engineering uh, in 1930. Um, and that was the depth of the, the depression 
and he was uh, the top graduate in his class in that year, and it was always the um, policy of General Electric to hire the top graduates, but they didn't that year because the economy was so bad. Mm. He briefly got a job working for some company in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, where my brother was born and, and where he met, you know, I, you know, his first boss there became a longtime friend. But, but then um, FDR came along and the New Deal and the Tennessee Valley Authority, and um, he got a job with the Tennessee Valley Authority designing hydroelectric dams, and the TVA sent him to the University of Tennessee um, in Knoxville mm -hmm. to get a second um, degree in civil engineering, and um, with the exception of, of some wartime service, my dad spent the rest of his life designing hydroelectric dams because that's where the technology of building hydroelectric dams was developed. Um, every place where <clears throat> a river goes from the Appalachian Mountains east to the Atlantic uh, seaboard, there's a drop in elevation, and that's a good place to, to build a dam. And that's how this was electrified. And so um, before I was born and in my very early years, uh, my family lived in several places in the south, um, uh, not, um, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, um, and always where dams were being built. And then uh, later, my dad started working for Bechtel Corporation in San Francisco, so I, my uh, school years, uh, early school years, were mostly in Mill, Mill Valley. All right. Uh, nice. <laughs> And and then um, work yeah and the Oroville Dam the one where the spillway uh, had trouble recently because of the extreme rain and stuff mm -hmm. I don't know if you followed that but oh, anyway yeah. that yeah well my dad worked on that project he probably had a lot to do with designing that dam um, I remember him going up there to Oroville uh, when I was a kid you know he'd make field trips and. And then worked in uh, Seattle for two or three years when the World Fair was on there uh, in, in Seattle, 61 to 63, or 65, from 61. And my family then moved to Canada, in, to Vancouver, uh, West Vancouver, when, in 1965, because my dad was then working on the um, what was then called the Portage Mountain Dam and is now called the W.A.C. Bennett Dam in nor northern British Columbia. Um, it was the world's largest earthfield dam at the time, and now the biggest one is the Aswan Dam in e Egypt. But, um, but um, he worked with the same group of people for his entire working life but all over the country. My mom figured out that while they were married, my family moved 36 times. Oh, wow. Uh, and my, my oldest sister never had a full year in the same school until her senior year in high school, which was pretty rough on her. Yeah. Wow. But... Um, anyway, that, that's how we ended up in Canada. And my, my dad died in 1969 when uh, while we were in Canada and I met you know people there and uh, I I went and started studying um, engineering at um, BCIT and UBC in in the Vancouver area and um, I well it's a long story you know I had <laughs> Um, adolescent shit for brains, I guess you could okay. say. But <laughs> right. I I dropped out of school and and uh, I but I got an absolutely wonderful engineering job 
um, uh, um, with a tiny little com company in West Vancouver whose only um, purpose for existence was developing um, expert testimony in lawsuits. Wow. Uh, um, so it, it's industrial failures and road accidents and stuff, you know, if, if it was a high, high money claim accident like a semi-trailer truck or, or a, a shake mill blew up or something like that, um, the, the company um, would investigate what happened to testify in court. And so there was a, a, a civil engineer, a mechanical engineer, and a metallurgist, and I was the assistant to all three. And so I got, for that job, I did photography and prepared metallurgical samples and did surveying of accident scenes and would take apart suspected components of, you know, a vehicle that had crashed or something like that mm -hmm. to relate it to the accident. And um, I just loved that job, but the problem was that at that time, a um, the British Columbia elected a a, a sort of socialist, semi-socialist government. The Dave Barrett government was elected, and they were bringing in no-fault car insurance. Meaning, uh, car insurance was and still is, you know, the liability part of it, it um, strictly limited to. Um, it was the government monopoly on car insurance and <clears throat> no fault, meaning insurance companies were no longer suing each other. Therefore, they weren't hiring experts to to prove that it was the other guy's fault. Right. <clears throat> and and Jack, my boss, said, well, that's 60 percent of our business gone. So no more company. <laughs> and as a result, I I um, with. Uh, my um, then friend Dave Cahill and his then wife Marjorie who had a little had started a little music store in Port Coquitlam near Vancouver we decided well let's move to Victoria and start a music store and I thought well you know I, I'm probably not going to last but you know I'm not doing anything else right now and um, that was in 1972 and the music store lasted for 40 years. Whenever anybody's going to the Midwest, and I lived in Chicago, Illinois, for years and years, I tell them to go to A440. If they're looking for a bow, if they're looking for a bass, if they need some repairs done, if they have a student who's looking for an instrument, A440 has been serving the community for years and years. They're located just west of Wrigley Field, in beautiful Chicago. They do great work, and they've been a big supporter of bass events over the years, whether it's the Chicago Bass Festival or really any base event a440 you guys rock check them out at a440 violin shop.com one thing that has impressed me about upton bass ever since i got to know them was how many artists there are out there that are so satisfied with the work that upton has done for them here's mark ramirez on his experiences having upton copy his beautiful cavani bass I do a lot of uh, moving around and giving master classes and stuff like this. I had a, a copy made of it by uh, by the Uptons, by Gary and uh, Eric Roy uh, at the Upton at the Upton shop. Um, they made a copy of it, but they made an even smaller copy. I think it's a seven eighths copy of the bass. Uh, I use it now. I use that bass for my solo playing, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which I do a lot. Recently, I've been doing a lot, especially here, and it has a detachable neck. The detachable neck, man, I tell you, in Europe, it's the craze. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Wow. <laughs> now, had you been playing music? Did you, did you, were you playing when you were a kid, v violin, or how, or was, what, did that come later yeah. in life? Okay. Music, banjo and guitar, and um, later, so the fiddle, and I play a lot of fiddle and mandolin now, and I've I play violin in a community orchestra, um, nice. but as time went on in our <clears throat> business in Victoria, the 
um, between Dave and myself, we sort of, I, I, I worked on fretted instruments, and <clears throat> but I gradually got more and more interested in the violin stuff, and um, people were coming to me with violins, and um, what the pattern that emerged after a while is that um, a local teacher would send a student in and to get some work done on the violin, and and apparently the teacher liked what what I was doing on the violins, and pretty soon the teacher was coming in with her own stuff. Or, <laughs> Um, and um, gradually the work that had been going down to um, uh, um, Armin Schleeps in Seattle um, started coming to me, and um, gradually um, <clears throat> um, more and more people were asking me about bows, and I didn't know a darn thing about bows. And I, I was so ignorant that I didn't know how ignorant I was. That, but um, Vicky Karolak, who, no, no, it was Sonia de Olivares, who was a viola player in the symphony at that time, um, happened to um, be a friend of um, Francis Rutherford, who at that time was living in Mountain View, California. Mm hmm um, um, Francis, uh, that was back in the extremely early days of Silicon Valley. I don't know if it even had that name yet. I, I guess, but um, Francis was a cello player, and he had been learning bow making with John Bolander, who worked with. Um, Um, Alfred, um, not Alfred Lenini, um, yeah, Bolander was working with Alfred Lenini in San Jose, and so Francis was trying to learn to make bows, and he could, he was starving, so that, well, I'll, I need to get a job in an orchestra, this is how long ago this is. Need to get a job in the orchestra to help sustain my bow making habit, <laughs> and couldn't get a job as a cello player in the orchestra. Well, I'll, I'll learn to play the bass. Wow. <laughs> um, so, he, he, darn if he didn't learn to play the bass. Pretty soon, he's uh, principal bass of San Jose Symphony. Oh, cool. Um. And then he got really interested in playing the bass. <clears throat> and um, uh, um, went to study with, um, who was the guy that's kind of a sort of modern, very modernistic bass playing in San Diego? Um, oh, uh, Bru was it Bert Turetsky, maybe? Uh, say it again? Uh, it could, it might have been Bert, Bert Turetsky. Turetsky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And and so Francis went and studied with him for a bit, but but then he got interested in in Gary Carr, and so Gary was coming to Victoria even in the early seventies, and <clears throat> um, Francis came up to. Um, um, go to the base camp where Gary was teaching, mm -hmm. and he was he kind of stayed with uh, Sonia de Alvarius, who we knew in, uh, here while he was doing that, and and Sonia said to Francis, "Well, there's this sort of talented young guy who needs to learn about uh, bows." Um, here in town, and could you go and uh, talk to him, you know? And so, literally, what happened? This would be 1978, maybe. Francis walks into our store, in our workshop, said, Hi, I'm Francis Rutherford. I'm here to teach you how to make both.
<laughs> huh? That's great. Oh, well, um, I thought, okay, well, you know, I would like to know how to rehair bows because people are always asking me about it. And how long, how hard that, can that be? I probably, you know, learn this in a couple hours or something like that. And, and um, so I, there, I had a couple of jug bows sitting around and one not too bad. And Francis had a few tools with him, and plus there were some of my things. And and I watched him over the period of a few hours totally transform that bow and do amazing stuff. And I just kind of was gobsmacked about how much there was to know. And he said, you can't just learn to rehair bows. If you want to do it responsibly, you have to understand all process um of making restoring bows and why don't you come and work with me in in um mountain view and and learn about bows which i did and and um it turns out that francis of course had been studying with gary carr he made the bow that gary still loves the best of all his bows now um and i I was familiar with Gary Carr even before I moved to Victoria because I'd seen him on CBC television. Mm -hmm. At that time, he, Gary was teaching in the Nova Scotia school system. Mm -hmm. um, and he did a special, they, the CBC did a TV show on him with Gary doing a, a sort of a combination of talk and recital. And I had seen that on TV and I just, was totally blown away as anybody at that time who ever saw Gary Carr would have been. Uh, and just how could you ever forget that? Nice. And, and <clears throat> so I got to Victoria and I saw a poster that there was a Gary Carr concert and thought, that's that guy I saw on TV. He's here in town. Oh, I'm going to that. Uh, and, you know, I did, but uh, I, I, would I ever approach him? No. I mean, I'm, no, I'm not going to go anywhere near that guy. That's like, I want to go see God. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but while I was working with Francis, um, um, Francis said, well, you know, why, why don't you go and talk to Gary? And he, he comes to Victoria and... and um, um, so uh, I sort of worked up my courage in, uh, in 79, yeah, in 79, uh, went to a concert that he did in conjunction with the, the, um, Johansson International Music Festival, which was a wonderful thing that we had going on for so many years at that time. And Gary was a principal part of that. And, and I sort of buttonholed him after a concert and introduced myself and said that um, I was a friend of Francis of Rutherford and and uh, um, Francis said I should meet you and um, and Gary's eyes just lit up and he said Francis Rutherford well you know if you've been working with Francis please come, come see me and. Um, and by the way, I've been having some trouble with my bass, which was the Kuzovitsky bass at that mm -hmm. time. And um, long story short, the next day, Gary's bass is on my workbench, and I think, oh, God, <laughs> now what am I going to do? <laughs> but I was able to solve some problems that he had for a long time with, with some mysterious buzzes. Um, and um, pretty soon, well, you know, if if you know one bass one bass player, pretty soon you know a hundred bass players. Right, right. And and after I started, I after I met Gary and started working for him, I was getting a lot of basses coming in. Plus. There, there were some really great musicians with great instruments who were coming to that music camp, 
And those musicians and their instruments were coming into my shop all the time then. And that was going on for years. Uh, I mean, like, um, uh, some really great stuff. Um, and bows. And uh, so I got more and more into it. So Gary had everything to do with my um, career in in sort of violin and bow work, and every, not only with basses. Uh, um, you know, he he had he was a real turning point in my life that way. But you know, with regard to the bass, I I didn't come to Gary because of my interest in the bass, it's more I was interested in the bass because of Gary. Right, right. And well, and yeah. then and then just to, to it's it, like it, it's so cool talking to Gary about your bases. He says, you know, when he travels, he never brings a bass as long as there's a Jim Ham bass in that, you know, in that city, he'll go there. Like and yeah. and, and your very first bass was for Gary, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, he had the Car Foundation mm-hmm. for a long time, and the Car Foundation commissioned the bases. To, he, he, Gary was always a believer in in new instruments, and he would commission new instruments in order to um, loan them out to students who needed good instruments, and. Um, I knew this, and after I had known Gary for um, a number of years, this would be about 1994, 93, 94, I, I ginned up my courage to ask him for a commission to, to make a base because by that time I had been working on a lot of bases, and I thought then, and quite honestly I still think now, that most old bases are crap. Mm-hmm. You know they're they're not really very well designed, and they're usually in horrible condition. Uh, um, um, the the people who are the best craft people, the people who are really good at working on on violins and cellos and stuff like that, don't want to work on basses because it's it's. It's twice the work for half the money. Right. Um, it, it's it's been true for a long time, um, and therefore the bases have been ending up on somebody's kitchen table somewhere, and and the and that makes it even worse because the thing that anybody who does work on instruments hates more than anything is trying to work on something that's already been messed up by somebody else. Sure. And that's most bases. <clears throat> so I, you know, I was because of Gary and because people were coming from all over the wor- world for, you know, the Johansson school of music and then car camp, you know, which, you know, after the Johansson international festival died and the, the school associated with that, because JJ because JJ Johansson died, that's basically what happened. Um, um, Gary continued to have car camp for many years after that because people still wanted to come to study with him. And um, so I had great bass players with with great instruments coming into my shop all the time, and uh, um, I was seeing. Uh, what's supposed to be the best old bases and you know I thought well you know if this is the best old stuff I think I can do better than that and so I asked Gary for a commission and he right away said well I definitely want you to make a base but this isn't for the car foundation this one's for me nice and that's the one that you saw Hey, this is Danny Zeman. I'm a jazz bass player currently living in Basel, Switzerland. 
uh, originally from Western New York region, Buffalo, and then Rochester. Um, I tour you know, throughout the States, throughout Europe, Asia, playing various uh, styles of jazz, windy hops, uh, early swing, more modern jazz. Um, I'm currently, again, living in Switzerland for the next next year or so. Um, right now, I'm playing the Diderio Helicor Pizzicatos, and I've been using them for about seven years now, and I have to say they are my favorite favorite string for jazz. Um, the clarity in sound and tone, intonation, everything is just exactly exactly what I'm looking for. They're not too bright. There's a really wonderful musical sustain that you can manipulate, uh, you know, for when you're playing ballads or more up-tempo uh, tunes. I mean, just the range of color and control that you get out of them is just exactly what I need. It suits my needs uh, perfectly, and I definitely encourage anyone who's looking for a, a new string to check out or, or wants something that, uh, you know, is is great for jazz and gives you more of that sustained sound, definitely consider the Helicor Pizzicatos. Pardon me. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable instrument. And, and I love that, like, like getting up close and seeing Gary demonstrate, like, some of the dimensions, you know, like, like the, the strings are a bit closer together than is average. Um, the, obviously your, 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 that remarkable, uh, neck, uh, you know, adjustable system that you've got. It's, 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 it's the first thing that jumped out at me is just like, it is amazing. The projection on that bass it is just mm-hmm. it is just a, a sonic cannon you know in, in a very positive way i i it's just it's it's really cool the the you know that how both the sound and the playability and everything is just a remarkable instrument well the design of that bass grew out of you know like i say everything my entire history with bass is is based on Gary Carr. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and um, at that at that time, Gary had two basses, <clears throat> which were both fantastic instruments in different ways. And the one he was playing all, on all the time was Kuzi, the Kuzovitsky bass. Um, which had been set up. It had a neck on it at that time that was made by um, uh, Lawrence LeMay mm-hmm. in Bloomington, Indiana. And LeMay made a neck um, <clears throat> that was based on what Gary wanted. It, it was narrower, had a thicker fingerboard, it had the strings closer together. All of that stuff wasn't my idea. That was Gary's idea. He, he um, And so I based the way that I set up that base for Gary on, on the way it had been set up, uh, on the way that um, Kuzi had been set up by LeMay. Um, um, but um, the design, I didn't. Uh, other people had copied Koozie, but I never liked Koozie as much as I liked Athena. Have you ever seen Athena? Uh, I I haven't, sadly. Oh. Well, that is the base that Gary got from his first teacher, Herman Reinshagen. So it has a, a beautiful carved woman's head on it, which is why it gets called Athena. Anyway, um, get, I always thought I preferred the sound of Athena to the Kusevitsky bass. Gary really liked it, but he had playability issues on, on it. The you know bow hitting the the center bouts. It had a shorter string length than he liked. It was a 40-inch string length, and uh, the uh, Kuzovitsky had, um, it's 106 centimeters, which is 41 and 5 eighths, um, which is pretty much what I consider to be a standard string length. So when I decided to make a bass, what I decided to do was to take the setup of the Kuzovitsky bass, but transfer it onto a body shape based on Athena, but with some differences. 
I made the upper bouts longer on the top only, not the back, in order to get some slope to the upper block as I wanted to make my adjustable neck idea work, which meant that the um, upper block had to be at a right angle to the string. The back that is on Athena right now is not the original back. It, like almost every flat back base in the world, I'm sure that it, the original back cracked into a million pieces and, and someone made a new, beautifully made back for it, but it's a carved back. And in order to fit a carved arched back on it with, without having to bend it, they filled in the bevel, you know, the, the sloping in part of the upper back, and you can see on, on Athena where that was done. And in order for it to work for the way that Gary plays, you know, reaching around it, I felt like it was re really important not only to have sloping shoulders, but to slope in from the back. And that's probably noticed on, on my base that, it, it it slopes in a lot from the back as well as the shoulders. Right. That means that if if you've got the heel of the neck sort of sitting in your armpit the way that Gary plays, without changing your arm position, changing your body position, within the, the swing of your arms is the entire compass of the base. You can reach back and, and hit the lowest notes and you can reach forward and hit the highest notes without having to move your body at all. And you can't do that with other bases. Right. Right. So, so that is how I came up with that design. Um, it, I took the shape of Athena and really with a boat builder friend of mine, we sort of drew it up and he, he thought, well, why don't we, instead of copying the exact shape, which is somewhat asymmetrical anyway, let's take whichever center bout curve, you know, there are four of them, whichever one we like the best, and whichever lower bout curve, again, there's four, if you figure half of the lower bout, the front and the back, and we'll take that, and then the, um, the nicest um, upper bout curve, became the curve for the back and then I designed my own curve for the top because I made the top longer and put that together and and made a shape and I'm pretty pleased with that shape um, and it provided the ergonomic issues and and there and I also in order to make the string length and setup work that by setup I mean the basic setup configuration that LeMay had done on the uh, uh, Kusevitsky base. I changed the F-hole position relative to the uh, um, center belt, and that solved the bow clearance problems. I gave him a base that was way easier for him to um, get around on, reach all the notes and, 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 and bow it without hitting, and the arching I did model after the Kuzovitsky base, even though I, I put that on to the Athena body shape, because the, the best part of the Kuzovitsky base is the top, which is fantastic. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's the most unbelievable piece of wood. It is. I, I had the chance about 12 years ago. I played a recital on that base, so I had it in my possession for a couple months, and yeah, it's yeah, a beautiful right. top. Yeah. Did it have my setup on it at that time, or did I? Oh, I, um, I don't think. Do you? I don't think it did at that time. This was kind of early on when they started loaning that bass out for people to do recitals. Well, it, it pissed me off, but the, um, David Gage cut the legs off the bridge that I fitted to it and put adjusters in it, and I can I never could figure out why. But um, but anyway, that was done, and and so it wasn't set up by me by the time that. Um, although the fingerboard in, is my fingerboard that's on it, so you were playing on my fingerboard. Um, so that base, this happened before uh, I made Gary's base, but um, during the time that I knew Gary. Um, 
I don't remember where it was, but he was traveling with it in a in a trunk, and something happened. I I have a theory about how it happened, but well, what I think happened is the trunk got put on one of those sort of trailers that behind a tug at an airport, you know, with the neck sticking out of the trailer, and I'm guessing they they uh, dro- drove the the baggage trailer through a doorway and in the trunk, sheared the top of the trunk off and the neck inside. Oh. And Gary was desperate to just have a base he could use. And a guy who sort of did a patch-up repair for him epoxied it all together and got it to work, you know. Mm. And uh, Gary played on it that way for a little while, but then when he was in England, he had um, Malcolm Healy make a new um, scroll for it. The scroll wasn't original anyway. Um, So Malcolm Healy made a new scroll and neck in the um, style of um, Prince LeMay had made. But Malcolm Healy reused the fingerboard that had been on it. Well, what I guess he didn't pay attention to was, or, or he just decided to live with, the LeMay neck had been put on crooked. It wasn't aimed down the center line of the instrument. And the fingerboard was a little made a little bit skewed in order to um, make the fingerboard line up with the bridge in the proper bridge position. So LeMay, or so Malcolm Healy, in reusing that fingerboard, then made a new neck, which again was crooked, in order to make the fingerboard line up. <laughs> <laughs> So, it, it, kind of a comedy of errors. And later, I made a new fingerboard, which again is uh, modified in order to make it line up because it had to accommodate the Malcolm Healy neck. And that's the fingerboard that's on it now. So I made I made the fingerboard that's on it, but it's on Malcolm Healy's neck with Malcolm Healy's skull. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The um, neck that I made, uh, I af- years after making um, the base for Gary asked me to make a, a new neck for Athena with the adjustable neck system, which I did. I, uh, so Athena now has a um, a neck and fingerboard with, uh, that uh, that's adjustable, made by me. It lines up right, correct. It's not crooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love, the, I, I love that system of yours, the adjustable neck system. It makes so much sense to, to, to not have to cut the, the, the feet off and put adjusters in. And it's, it's a rem- – and, and, yeah, it's great. Well, Gary, while he was traveling with, um, with the Kusevitsky base, um, always had a half a dozen bridges with him for both different string heights based on climate and different kinds of sound kind of that he'd get uh, with the bridges. And, I, you know, I cut several bridges for for that bass. He would, but he never wanted an adjustable bridge because, well, it, you know, the thing that Gary doesn't like about the adjustable bridge is not mainly the sound, although it is partly the sound. It's the feedback he feels the bass is doing through his bow. Um, and if you understand the whole pro- instrument and bow uh, together as a vibrating system, an extremely complex vibrating system, which they are, because um, every part of the instrument vibrates and the bow is vibrating and, and they work together, what Gary is an absolute genius at doing more than anyone else on, on on the planet is intuitively feeling how a bow interacts with an instrument. As soon as the, the bow is moving, it's not only exciting the instrument, but the instrument is in turn exciting the bow, and Gary can feel how that's doing, how that's working, and he can adjust the 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 speed and the position of the bow and and force of the bow against the instrument um, 
in order to have it perfectly hook up with with every um, vibration cycle of the string at whatever pitch and whatever string he's playing in order to get the maximum sound for the minimum effort. And that's mm-hmm. why you can't hear his bow changes and how, why he can get so much sound. Wow. And Gary was never able to quantify uh, to, uh, to scientifically understand how that worked, but a, a person that did scientifically understand how it worked and who came and studied with him, with Gary in Bloomington, was Knut Gutler. Mm-hmm. And I got to know Knut Gutler at Oberlin, even though Knut was an extremely good bass player. He was the principal bass of Bergen Norway Symphony, or maybe Oslo. Was it Bergen or Oslo? I forget. But And did some solo bass recordings. Um, he he kind of quit playing bass later in his life and got into studying acoustics, which is how how come he came to Oberlin. He he, he, was, he was there to talk about um, violin and bow acoustics. But Knut um, analyzed what what Gary was doing, and even though Knut played French bow, he learned to do with a French bow what Gary does with a German bow and get that same uh, um, effect. Anyway, it's absolutely dependent upon the ability to feel through the bow what's going on. I can't do it. I've stood with Gary and, and had him play and he said uh, tried to place my hand on the bow while he's doing and see if I can feel what he's doing and he I I can't do it. I absolutely believe what he says about what the bass is doing and uh, he feels not only through the bow but through his left hand what the strings are doing because the neck is a part of the vibrating system too. Um but the reason that I wanted to make an adjustable neck is so that he wouldn't have to have an adjustable bridge and yet you could still adjust it and that moves the adjustment function away from the most critical piece of wood on the instrument which is the bridge to the least vibrating part of the instrument with the upper block that was my reason for doing it it was an acoustic idea wanting to get rid of the need to have an adjustable bridge, and at the same, it it really hadn't at that time occurred to me that it was going to be a thing that people wanted to do to make the neck of the bass removable, but it, as years went by and it became more and more impossible to travel in an airplane with a bass, more and more people wanted removable necks. Well, my bass has always had a removable neck. It's just that, you know, if you just take the strings off an instrument and put them back on, it takes a while for things to settle down and, you know, for the instrument to get back to sounding. So it's not an ideal thing to have to take your instrument apart and put it back together again if you travel. But if it means you can have your instrument, as um, well, it becomes something that you may have to live with. And, you know, so now uh, other people want to use my system not only because it makes the neck adjustable, but because it makes it removable. So I've been helping out Nick Lloyd and Daniel Hatches with adapting the system to their bases. Yeah, it's it's remarkable and it's great. It's got that dual that dual benefit like you're talking about. You 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 can you don't need the bridge adjusters. You can move the move the neck e- super easily, but then yeah, you can also remove it so you can deal with the current airline situation, but Jim, thank you so much for chatting. And folks, check out everything that he is up to and that he's done in his career at hamstringsmusic.com. And I love doing these conversations. Jim is somebody that I've known about for decades and 
getting a chance to sit down and chat with him. It's such a thrill. And to be able to put it out in the world like you can do with a podcast, that's an additional <laughs> thrill. So thank you, Jim, for chatting with me. And thank you for listening to this show. If you want to learn more about luthiers, we've interviewed a ton of people from Barry Colstein to Trevor Davis to... Tom and George Martin to, oh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Patrick Chartone, so many people. And if you go to ContraBaseConversations.com slash Luthier, I believe that's right, uh, you will find all of the episodes we've done going back over a decade. And if you're new to this show or if you've been listening a long time, regardless, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a message, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. You know, I open up my email every day and I have sometimes sometimes over a dozen messages daily from people uh, all across the globe, all walks of life, from people in their teens to people in their 70s. And it's just so interesting for me to hear about where people are from, what they're up to, what their life path has been, what they're interested in hearing more of. That's just super interesting to me. So send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Contrabase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And if you're looking for a double bass, Mitch is making beautiful instruments in the Dallas area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I am your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 